with five different armies surrounding Palestine. The Jewish National Council had just 24 hours to prepare for a day that had been 2,000 years in the making. Council members placed a telephone call to Zionist leader Heim Weizmann, who was in New York, rounding up United Nations support for the new state. When he heard they had voted for statehood, he exclaimed in Yiddish, what are they waiting for, the idiots? That same day, Golda Meir was ordered to fly to Jerusalem to meet with outgoing British leaders. She wanted to stay in Tel Aviv and attend the proclamation, but Ben-Gurion was adamant. So Golda boarded a small Piper Cub. But as her plane flew over the Judean hills, the engine malfunctioned and the pilot was forced to turn back to Tel Aviv. So Golda got her wish, a front row seat at the proclamation ceremony. 350 invitations were sent out to Jewish leaders, rabbis, and members of the Haganah. Dark festive attire was requested. And the invitation stipulated that the time and place of the ceremony was to be kept secret. The council decided to hold the ceremony in the Tel Aviv Art Museum. It was a modest building, small enough to be easily guarded and partly below ground level in case of an air raid. The council met for the last time to go over the wording of the declaration, which had been written by a group of lawyers. Religious members refused to sign the document unless it contained a mention of God, while others refused to sign anything that did mention God. David Ben-Gurion came up with a compromise. To the final line of the declaration, he added, with trust in the rock of Israel, a phrase that satisfied both sides. The night before the ceremony, Ben-Gurion still wasn't happy with the language of the proclamation. So that evening in his home, he rewrote the entire speech. While less than two miles away, the Tel Aviv Art Museum was being prepared for the ceremony. Two carpenters worked through the night to build a small stage. The entire budget for the event was just $200. So organizers borrowed hundreds of chairs from nearby cafes and local stores lent them microphones and carpets. A borrowed portrait of Theodore Herzl was placed at the front of the room and two blue and white flags were hung on either side of his portrait. The flags bore the same design that had been introduced at Herzl's first Zionist Congress 50 years earlier. At Ben-Gurion's request, the paintings in the main hall were replaced with the work of Jewish artists like Marc Chagall and Samuel Hershenberg. The stage was set. On the afternoon of May 14th, several council members met to approve the final draft of the declaration. The text was approved unanimously, but just hours before it would be read, the new state still didn't have a name. Historical names like Zion and Judea were proposed and rejected. It was Ben-Gurion who decided that the name would be simply Medinat Israel, the State of Israel. One hour before the ceremony, council members rushed home to change their clothes while a secretary quickly typed out the declaration. With just minutes to spare, Zev Sharef, the man carrying the final copy, couldn't get a taxi. So he hitched a ride to the museum. His car got pulled over for speeding, and a policeman started to write him a ticket. Sharef argued that the ticket wouldn't be legal because the British had left and there was no longer any government to enforce it. Plus, he added, if you keep us any longer, there won't be a new government because I'm the one holding the Declaration of Independence. The policeman waved them on, and just one minute before the ceremony, Sharef handed Ben-Gurion his speech. Despite the instructions for secrecy, 
The news had leaked out and a large crowd gathered outside the museum. Jewish leaders were now racing the sunset to finish the ceremony before the Sabbath began at five o'clock. At 4 p.m., David Ben-Gurion called the meeting to order. The crowd rose and sang Hatikva. Then Ben-Gurion read the declaration aloud. The land of Israel was the birthplace of the Jewish people. Here they first attained to statehood, created cultural values of national and universal significance, and gave to the world the eternal book of books. Thus we hereby declare the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Israel to be known as the State of Israel. We appeal to the Arab inhabitants of the State of Israel to preserve peace and participate in the upbuilding of the state on the basis of full and equal citizenship. We appeal to the Jewish people throughout the diaspora to rally around the Jews of Eretz Israel and to stand by them in the great struggle for the realization of the age-old dream, the redemption of Israel, placing our trust in the rock of Israel. We affix our signatures to the proclamation on the soil of the homeland, in the city of Tel Aviv, on this Shabbat Eve, the 14th of May, 1948. After each member of the new government had signed the proclamation, the orchestra played Hatikva once again. As the music died down, Ben-Gurion declared, the state of Israel is established. This meeting is adjourned. It had taken just 32 minutes to bring independence to a people who had been without a country for 2,000 years. Outside the museum, hundreds of people danced while others wept. That night, Ben-Gurion wrote a simple entry in his diary. Throughout the country, profound joy and jubilation. And once again, as on 29th November, I feel like the bereaved among the rejoicers. Everybody was cheering in the streets. It was a big thing, dancing in the streets and all this. And he was standing in the back there. And he was asked, this is a great day. This is your dream come true. 2,000 years, we're in diaspora. You didn't like the diaspora. You want Hebrew, you want the state, you want this, you've got it. He says, what well, the people are dancing here, what they don't know is tomorrow we've got a war. And he said, there's going to be a big price. It wasn't long before Ben-Gurion was proven right. In the Declaration of Independence, he had offered the Arabs an equal place in the new state. But that night, his olive branch was answered by the roar of Egyptian warplanes. At one minute past midnight, they bombed the city of Tel Aviv. And at dawn, tanks from five Arab armies rolled into the new state of Israel. Jewish diplomat Abba Ibn later recalled that Israel knew the taste of birth and the fear of death in the same moment. A year later, in 1949, all sides had grown weary of fighting. Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria signed armistice agreements with Israel. The Jewish state had survived the first of many challenges to her existence. The story of modern Israel is essentially the story of the return to the ancestral homeland of exiles from persecution, insecurity, and fear. In quest of freedom, 
human dignity, independence, and peace. She used to tell us very often, I never realized what John Hancock meant until I signed Golda Meir in Declaration of Independence. Me, little Golda Meir, signing Declaration of Independence. Two days after Israel declared independence, Golda Meir was sent back to America to raise more funds for the new Israeli army. For this trip, she received the first Israeli passport ever issued. One month later, she became Israel's first ambassador to the Soviet Union. She later served as the Minister of Labor and as Foreign Minister. In the early 1960s, Meir was diagnosed with lymphoma and briefly retired. But after the sudden death of Prime Minister Levi Eshkol in 1969, she was chosen to replace him. Meir held the office until 1974, when she resigned amid controversy over Israel's handling of the Yom Kippur War. She died of lymphoma four years later, at the age of 80. Two days after independence, Chaim Weizmann was chosen to be the first president of the new state of Israel, a position he held until his death. In his first official act, he met with President Truman to ask for funds to build the new country. From that meeting, he secured an export-import loan of $100 million. I take the first opportunity to express my heartfelt thanks to the President of the United States and to the government of this country for all they've done in making out of Israel a reality. The Weizmann Institute, founded in 1934, became a world leader in scientific and medical research. In 1952, Weizmann died at the age of 77 leaving behind a legacy as Israel's first great diplomat. Dr. Weitzman's first name was C-H-A-I-M. And I didn't know how to pronounce it, so I called him Cham. Called him that to his face, and he liked it. He was a wonderful man, one of the wisest people I think I ever met. We had a long, long conversation. And he explained the situation from his viewpoint. And I listened to him very carefully. And at the same time, I sent for Eddie Jacobson, and they both sat down and talked to me for a long, long time. When we were through, I said, all right, you two Jews have put it over on me, and I'm glad you have. After talking with Weizmann, President Truman instructed the State Department to support the UN's plan for partition in Palestine, which they did reluctantly. Then on May 14, 1948, President Truman recognized the new state of Israel, just 11 minutes after the British mandate officially ended. The United States recognizes the provisional government as the de facto authority of the new state of Israel. Ten days later, Chaim Weizmann visited the White House and gave the president a Torah scroll as a symbol of Israel's gratitude. Truman's response? Well, thanks, Cham. I've always wanted one of these. Regarding his support for Israel, Truman would later say, I am Cyrus. When Harry Truman, in retirement, is honored for having recognized the state of Israel, his, the words that come out of his mouth are, I am Cyrus. He was the one who helped the Jews return to the homeland thousands of years later. And he was the one who helped the Jews rebuild the third Jewish commonwealth. And he was the one who history was fortunate enough to have in the right place in the right time. History was fortunate, the American people were fortunate, the Jewish people were fortunate. He was a true hero. I bring to the American people the warm greetings of the people of Israel and our gratitude for the unfailing sympathy of America 
with our efforts for independence and regeneration. David Ben-Gurion became the first Prime Minister of Israel and the first Minister of Defense, offices he held for 14 years. He was later named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Important People of the 20th Century. In our revival, we have been inspired by the message of our Bible and by the traditions of our ancient history, which elevate the dignity of man and the principle of justice, in which command us to love our neighbor. When Ben-Gurion retired from political life, he moved to a kibbutz in the Negev Desert, where he spent his final years writing a history of Israel. In November of 1973, Ben-Gurion suffered a cerebral hemorrhage that would take his life two weeks later. At the same time, his grandson Alon was a patient at a different hospital. He had fought as a paratrooper in the Yom Kippur War and was still recovering from serious injuries. I knew about him, that he's in the hospital. He didn't know about me. When he asked, where's Alon? They said, ah, he's in the field, he's fine. Someone bought me a small TV, I'll never forget it. We saw the funeral through the television, black and white. Some of the doctors came and they sat with me. The doctor said it's an end of an era. Since its rebirth, Israel has survived wars, terror attacks, and political opposition to its very existence. At the time of independence in 1948, there were just 650,000 Jews living in Israel. Today, that number has grown to more than 6 million. And every year, thousands more from around the world are coming home. <laughs>